All right, so um, Terence already quickly introduced uh, Kubernetes. And uh, our next speaker is actually working for Dutch startup Blendel. And they run it in production, and he's going to share us all of the stuff that they have learned over the last uh, period. And I think a little looking out forward to the next stuff coming up, things you were hoping for, at least. Um, please welcome Kumbola. Thank you. Well, we'll do it like this. OK, before I start, um, uh, this is going to sound strange. I want you guys to stand up for a minute. Please do. Only be for a minute. OK. And now sit back down again. So I just fooled your bodies into being active again, so your blood should start flowing again. Sorry. I'll be the last talk today, so then we can get to go to drink. Um, so, um, hello. I'm Koen Bolle uh, from the Dutch startup uh, Blendel in the Netherlands. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about our history with Kubernetes, our current setup, what's next, and some tips and tricks along the way. Um, 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 I want to do some inquiries. Uh, who here uses Kubernetes? So that's seven. Uh, of those in production? OK, that was honest. <laughs> who here plays with Kubernetes? It's a little bit more. OK, that's good. Well, I hope I can, fin can, con can convince you to start using it. Um, uh, first, a little bit of context. Uh, what is Blendl? Uh, what are we? We are um, a startup where we create a platform for users to consume journalism um, easier. Uh, cross publishers, uh, paper article if you want. Uh, you can create that one article from the New York Times and that other that interview from this other country, uh, this other publisher from maybe a different country. Um, we have around 1.3 million users right now, uh, mostly active in the Netherlands, where we started, where we launched. Um, we got most of the major publishers signed in the Netherlands, so people in the Netherlands can read all their journalism on Blendl and pay per article. And we've started in Germany, and we are uh, currently in our closed beta in the US, starting to get a feel around for that country as well. They say it's kind of a thing. Um, our mission is to uh, help you discover and support uh, the world's best journalism. So we want to make young people pay for journalism again. Um, and we hope to achieve that. Um, uh, this is our website or our mobile app or uh, uh, on Android. And you just have your timeline of articles which we personalize for you. Uh, you should read this article. This is an article everyone should read, and you can consume that. So that's basically what we do. Um, but you're not interested in that. You're here to, to know what we do with Kubernetes. So let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, when we started with Kubernetes, um, I got bored there, and it, otherwise it wouldn't fit my, my presentation, so I uh, abbreviated it to uh, KHS. Um, Within Blendl, we launched a separate product. It, we named it the Blendl button. And it was a, a button publishers could put on their own websites so users could pay per article using our system. And that was a new project within our company. It had a completely owned API and a completely own front end client. So we thought, this Kubernetes thing sounds cool, looks cool, let's start. Um, that was back in the time when Kubernetes was at version uh, 0.9. Um, it was horrible. No, it wasn't. It was, we had some struggles. Um, it was really vague because we also was just learning Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is a tool you have to get comfortable with before it starts to pay off the, the e advantages. So there were some fake um, uh, issues, and it was really hard to debug. Uh, but that got better and better and better and better. Um, and actually, we already really liked the concept of it. So um, we figured um, it was time to, to go forward with Kubernetes for our, the rest of our infrastructure. 
So now, um, almost all of our infrastructure is running on Kubernetes, with an exception here and there I won't go into. Um, mostly things that weren't fine and we don't want to look at, so we'll move it when we need to. Um, way back in our history, like at the beginning of the company, that's three years ago, so, um, we started out with bare metal at LeaseWeb, and um, at one point we realized and we decided that infrastructure was not our core business. We wanted to make a platform to sell journalism, and managing databases and slaves and backups wasn't part of that. So we decided it was time to move to, um, in our case, AWS, um, where they had this managed database, which we were really happy to use. Um, and then we, we did this other project, this Blendl button in Kubernetes, and we wanted to move to Kubernetes. Uh, and our option was, our best option was uh, uh, Google Cloud Engine. So we moved there first. So we started with a lift and shift, so we could use their network, and then we finally moved to Kubernetes. And uh, that was around, oh, we're currently at Kubernetes uh, 1.5, um, but I made this presentation last week, and I believe today my colleagues are upgrading to 1.6. Um, it is less horrible. No, uh, we're loving it. Um, uh, and we're not running our databases in Kubernetes, as uh, uh, Terry explained to you. That's just a managed database now. Um, yeah, let's continue. Uh, our current setup is hosted at uh, the Google Container Engine, and the K is because the C was already taken. Um, and they manage our Kubernetes master node, which is really nice. I did for a separate project, I manage my own Kubernetes cluster, especially upgrades. It's really useful that you don't have to manage your own master node. It's really nice. We're currently running up to nine nodes, uh, and our infrastructure runs there in there. Um, we're trying to stay up to date because we look forward to new features um, and we wanted to use them as fast as we can. So mostly, we wait a week when it's available to, in the Google uh, Container Engine. We wait a week and then we upgrade our, um, our cluster, which is actually very painless. Like every upgrade we did so far had zero downtime. You just pull, pull down some nodes, you drain them, you spin up the new versions, and it will work. Um, yeah, probably me saying this right now will make that the next time it won't. And that's my bad. Uh, and one of the most interesting things I think we do is we use preemptible nodes from Google. Um, got a separate slide for that. Uh, preemptible nodes, they are ethereal, um, volatile nodes. They only live for a maximum of one day, and you never know when they go down. These are the cheap version, cheap nodes from Google. You, know, you have them for at least an hour, and at most one day. And at some point, they will just fail. Um, and they're really cheap. They're like 75% off. So it really saves a lot of money. But it also gives us a lot of uh, advantages in how we manage our infrastructure right now. Because uh, only two of our n nine nodes is a regular nodes that don't die every day. Um, so all of our um, deployments need to be able to uh, continue running when a node falls out over. Um, so it helps us, it forces us to, to make robust, robust and versatile software. Um, and if you don't, you'll, you'll notice very fast, at least within the same day. Um, yeah, there are some uh, things uh, you have to remember, that even if you're, you're making this very tiny application, this one monitor that j is a Go binary that does nothing and reports to Slack once a week, you still have to run that in at least three replicas, because it can die any second. Um, so it can cause some hurt. Um, and another trick is in Kubernetes, you can say, well, this part, it needs to run on a, on a, on a node, on a compute node, with, th with this label. Uh, so we labeled our regular nodes as regular nodes. So the, the, we have a few like pet pods, uh, which we don't really want to fail every, every day. And we just say, well, with node affinity, 
run this pod always on our regular nodes. So that makes them more stable. Um, uh, another thing you have to um, really help Kubernetes with is that your software, your, your services have really good health checks. Because otherwise, when a node uh, falls over and a new pod is spinned up and your health check is too eager to say it's healthy, Kubernetes will think, oh, he's healthy again, I'll focus on something else. And that gave, gave us a lot of hurt. Well, while we were thinking everything was fine, um, the new pods were not ready yet. And other pods were already going down. Um, uh, this one morning was last week. I was looking, because uh, I always have um, my pods open in the terminal, and I saw like a few of the pods that got destroyed and some new we were creating, so I was thinking by myself, oh, that's probably a uh, preemptible node that just died. And I checked the logs and it was true. And then another wave of those came in the same minute, and another one. So three of our, our preemptible nodes died, and we got three new ones, and it managed. We, were, we had, didn't have any downtime or any missed messages or anything like that. Um, so um, that gives us, the, us the, the feeling that nodes can just go down. Um, and that's really useful. So like, aside from the obvious price um, advantage, I really recommend using preemptible nodes for your Kubernetes cluster. How, did, how weird it might sound. And Google was actually really surprised we did this. Really nice. Um, so what do we run in Kubernetes, you ask? Everything. OK, I'm lying here. Um, uh, we do run most of our, our infrastructure in, in Kubernetes. Our main core API, our, our legacy, our monolith, uh, which is a Ruby application, a large one, which use does all the purchases of items and the sharing and stuff like that. Um, and we're slowly uh, um, getting logic out of that monolith into microservices, and all those microservices run in Kubernetes as well. Um, another big thing we run in Kubernetes, which, uh, is, which we're really happy with, is our recommendation engine. So users get their personalized bundle or newsletter every morning which is specific for every user, and that's a streaming system where messages go through Kafka um, into processors, and it, they produce bundles of items. And all those workers run in Kubernetes and out of scale as well. Um, and of course, a lot of internal tooling and Slack bots, et cetera, because it's really easy for developers to set up something in Kubernetes and run it in production. It's really useful. Um, yeah, another thing we, we started running in Kubernetes in its own cluster, actually, is our own CI. Um, we are starting using Jenkins, aside from Travis and Worker. And it runs in Kubernetes, and for every job it runs, for every test it runs, it spins up a pod, and this auto scales. So we don't have any queues in our CI, which is really useful. And that was really easy to manage in, in Kubernetes. Um, yeah. What's actually really fun about the recommendation system is that uh, we use auto scaling for that. So if there are a lot of messages from one topic and um, the, the workers can't keep up, automatically more pods will be started and to, to, to clean out that backlog, and when that's finished, it will uh, scale down again. It's really useful for us. We don't even have to look at that. Um, I, wanna I wanna say something about Kubernetes namespaces. Um, so uh, Terry, didn't, uh, he did an amazing introduction into Kubernetes for you guys. I'm really happy with that. Um, but you can divide your pods and services and uh, deployments into namespaces. And we do something there which isn't really best, best practice, but we really like it. Um, and we uh, suffix our namespaces with dash production and dash uh, staging. As were um, normally you would see in Kubernetes, it's just a label called uh, production or staging. Um, so for example, 
We have our core API production and our core API staging and our experiments API staging. And we give every project its own namespace. So every microservice lives in its own namespace. And every Slackbot does as well, uh, except for <laughs> Slackbots, which we have one namespace for all our bots, et cetera. Um, so that's, uh, we're currently around 60 namespaces, and uh, it's ever growing, of course. And that's really useful when you're working. When I'm working on a recommendation system, and I have my watch on all, uh, all the pods running, I just see those of the recommendation for production. Or if I'm trying something out on staging, I just see the pods for staging for our recommendation system. So we really like that. And I, I'm not bothered by pods for our other teams if they're working on something different. Um, and um, if we manually spin up a pod, like sometimes I just need a bash environment that, doesn't, that isn't my laptop because I want to go home. I just spin up, manually spin up a pod in the default namespace. I start my job, and then I go home. And the next day, it's finished. It's really easy to spin up a pod. Um, yeah. Uh, onto what we, th what I think is one of the vaguest things: How do you manage deployments in a production setting? Like, how do you? Because it's all easy in theory, but you want to. Everybody wants to deploy. Everybody make, wants to make changes. Um, so, um, one of the important things to know about working at Blendle is that every repository. Um, applies the scripts to rule them all rules from GitHub. So every repository has a script test, and a script deploy, and a script bootstrap, and a script run. So if I pull any repository for the first time, I just do script bootstrap, script test, and it runs the test suite. And that's also the same thing that our CI runs when it wants to deploy uh, a merged branch. Um, and um, uh, so you can always also deploy from your local machine if you need to, and if you have the right credentials, of course. Um, um, so let's just let me just give an example for our core API, our large monolith. Um, as you saw in the previous of the talk from Jerry, that there are a lot of resources, the GEML files, the deployment, and the, the services, and maybe the load balancers. And you have the namespace resources, and even um, the secrets are resources. And for our, our larger projects, our main projects, we store all those resources in, um, in Git. So every change on that is done via a pull request. Um, and whenever you deploy that, it will fetch the secrets from our password store, which is encrypted in GitHub. And um, it deploys, applies the the resources every time again, every time you do a deployment. And Kubernetes will just know what changed and what not. And it will do a rolling update or not. Um, so um, and whenever I want to do a, de a deployment, I'll just say script deploy production without ever see have seen the project before. And it will just work. And CI does the same thing. Um, if I wanted to make something out to deploy, I just have to make sure that script deploy works and the secrets are in our password store. Um, so for our core API, <laughs> it goes a little bit beyond Terry's example. We have over 2,000 lines of resource GEMLs, uh, GEML file. Uh, um, but that's because there are two variants. And there's also a local variant which you can run on your machine. Uh, using Minikube, which is a very small Kubernetes run on your computer tool. Really awesome. If you want to test and work with Kubernetes, I highly recommend checking out Minikube, because uh, it just runs entire Kubernetes on your computer very easily. Um, and our, this project, you can easily just run on your computer and see if it will deploy this big change you made. Um, and this also incl includes services and pods for sidekick workers, the uh, sidekick web, our queuing system, um, the, an Nginx pod, and some other proxies that connects us to other data centers and stuff. Um, so because the project was this big monolith, it, it actually took some effort to get that like logically and stable into Kubernetes. Um, 
So for this, there were some developers involved and some testing experience. Uh, but now it runs and it's really easy to change and to deploy um, changes. Um, another fact for our recommendation system, we have a lot of processors that just listen to channel to uh, Kafka topic Y, X, and then produce to Kafka topic Y. And there's only one resource file. And for each of those processors, it generates a resource file and applies it. So it's a dynamic resource, uh, Kubernetes resources for each deployment, uh, which makes it a lot more manageable. Um, but for smaller uh, projects, for example, a Slack bot or this internal support tool or uh, this small microservice you're, you're you only Android uses. Um, um, you, uh, for example, a Slack bot I made it only uses the deployment as a resource file in GitHub, and the rest I just created with via command line. I said, create namespace uh, this Slack bot and uh, uh, create secret um, this secret this Slack webhook URL because um, they ne almost never change. And then whenever uh, I run script deploy, it will get this, uh, this one resource file that's in the repository. It will substitute some environment variables. Uh, in this case, it's only one, it's the, the image. Um, and then applies it to Kubernetes. And if you check out our other projects, you will see a lot of uh, variable substitutions in our um, resource files because secrets might be in there or something like that, or dynamic for staging, we want a different image. In this case, it's just the image, which is um, the git ref tag. Um, and so whenever I run script deploy production, that's just run and applied, and the same goes for CI. Uh, and in this case, I just run it manually whenever it's changed because that never ever happens. Um, and then we have a lot of other projects which I won't get into right now, just to give two examples, a large one and a small one. Um, so about Kubernetes, um, we really like it. Um, it results in a very stable software stack, infrastructure stack, um, uh, especially with the uh, preemptible nodes. Um, and what, what I really like is that we don't really have operations anymore. We only have developers. And I actually have data scientists working in Kubernetes and making deployments, et cetera. So like our entire ops teams is a student of 19 year that comes into the office once one day a week. And he does the, the difficult parts. And the rest is just developers deploying their own code, which makes for good code. Um, points we still have issues with is um, um, scheduled jobs, cron jobs, and uh, it results right now in us installing cron in a pod, which is really awkward. Um, or I'm really this is my code, so I have this pod. It's run, run in Python, and it says, while through, sleep for a second. Is it already four o'clock? Then do the action. I'll sleep for a second. It's not what you want, <laughs> but I uh, well, couldn't be bothered to figure out something else, so that's really awkward. Um, and another thing is monitoring. We're, there are a lot of options, and we didn't put too much time to it yet to figure out what will work best for us. So right now, like a month ago, I had my, my monitor open in my terminal, and I noticed this pod was in a crash loop. So I was telling to my teammates on Slack, is this a problem? And they say, oh, yes. Then why didn't we get alerted? OK. So that's things we still need to figure out. Um, uh, so hey, I learned about this thing called Prometheus today. I might check that out. Might be a good thing. Um, some uh, closing notes for me. Um, we run uh, nine nodes, of which two are only stable surface. The rest is preemptible, 60 namespaces. 40 ingress uh, types that, is, that are Google load balancers, incoming, incoming endpoints, 100 services, 200 deployments, and uh, over 400 pods. 
Um, a few tips I have is if you use namespaces, get a tool to switch between namespaces. You don't want to type dash dash namespace blah every time you use kubectl. Um, uh, I'll plug a, a little script I made in the last slide. Um, get comfortable with the kubectl command, because it really helps you. If you describe a, a failing part, you can see, oh, it has trouble with pulling the image because of authentication issues or something like that. So uh, I use kubectl. Uh, almost as much as I use uh, my git command, for example. Um, uh, and you can use uh, auto completion with kubectl, which really helps you learn the tool uh, as well. Um, because Kubernetes really gets powerful if you get comfortable with it, destroying pods, etc. It's really nice. And uh, as I already said, so uh, try out Minikube, which is uh, run Kubernetes on your local machine in a few minutes, and then start working with it. I use it to, to test out, but we also use it to run our big projects locally. Um, well, yeah, that's everything I uh, wanted to talk to you. Thank you.